So Joe Jonas was recently in a Xeomin commercial and I want to take a look at this commercial and see what's going on with the neurotoxin in Joe's face. The title of this video is Beauty on Your Terms with Joe Jonas and Xeomin. Who wants to wake up looking like someone else? Not me. So I think many people have argued that in these first few seconds he's already looking like somebody else. And so we'll break that down. Something that's important to keep in mind is that Xeomin is one of the top three neurotoxins that are used in everyday sort of cosmetic care for the face to paralyze muscle so that you can get fewer wrinkles showing on the face. There's Xeomin, there's Botox, and there's Dysport. And we'll go through the differences at least between Xeomin and Botox. Botox being the most popular type of neurotoxin. Whether I'm home or on the road or somewhere in between. So what I'm noticing here is that when Joe is animating and he's moving his eyebrows, the left eyebrow seems to move more than the right. The right one is fairly paralyzed and the left one not as much. So it creates this, this balance in the way that his face moves. So I wanted to take a look back at another video before he received these injections of neurotoxin to see if his eyebrows maybe naturally move like that. So let's take a look at this video called Joe Jonas Takes a Lie Detector Test. This was for Vanity Fair. Is your full name Joseph Adam Jonas? Yes. You can see how he's moving his eyebrows quite equally from one side to the other. That right eyebrow is going up very nicely. And so when I look back at the more recent video on Xeomin, my suspicion is that Joe was not injected with the same dose from one side of the forehead to the other side. There are three common areas where you would consider injecting the face with neuromodulator, and that includes the forehead, the glabella, and the crow's feet. And so I'm not sure if Joe had injections in all three areas, or just one or two of the areas. My guess is that he probably at least had the forehead and the glabella injected. The way that these neuromodulators are dosed is based on the number of units. And there are different calculations for how many units are in a certain amount of volume of the neuromodulator, but let's just say they're measured in units. And when we think about the three different areas, forehead, glabella, crow's feet, I like to take a fairly standard dose for most people of about 20 units on the forehead. Some will argue that that's too much and that you can start with a smaller dose. And I think that there's some truth to that for the forehead. But for a, a man such as Joe Jonas, you wouldn't wanna go too, too low as far as the number of units because it's just not gonna be strong enough to impact change to muscle, right? So you have to have a sense of the strength of the muscle prior to determining the number of units. But in general, let's just say 10 to 20 units on the forehead. Glabella, something similar. You can do a light dosing of about 10 units and it can go up to as high as 20, 30 units to really impact change in the glabella. And also a lot of times it depends on what the person wants. Some people want that more frozen look. Other people want a more natural, realistic look where they still have movement of the muscles. Crow's feet, Typically, also uh, about 20 units combined, so about 10 units on each side. Again, you can half that dose for the proper patient if they want to go more uh, subtle with the change. When you inject for the forehead, you have to be very careful because the forehead is the only muscle, it's called the frontalis muscle, that moves the eyebrows up. All the other muscles that live around the eyebrow and around the eye actually tend to depress the eyebrows. The only one that elevates is the frontalis muscle. So when you go to inject it, if you're trying to paralyze it to reduce the forehead wrinkles, you have to be careful not to overdo it and not to inject too low. Because when you inject too low, you can get paralysis that rides low onto the eyebrow, causing the eyebrow to get heavier and almost droop down a little bit and not have any movement left. And my guess is because the right side was either injected with too high of a dose or the injections were placed too low close to the eyebrow. Usually you want to keep about a one centimeter clearance zone between the top of the eyebrow and where the injections are placed. I try to take care of my skin because I believe less is more. I really care what I put in my body. He's saying here that he believes in taking care of his skin. So there are many different ways to take care of the skin and some are very non-invasive and some are more invasive. The less invasive ways to take care of the skin are to use things like sunscreen, 
to use uh, retinol and antioxidants as topical creams. And then you get into more and more sort of invasive ways to take care of the skin. And that can mean something like a laser resurfacing where you're essentially burning off the outer layers of the skin. You can do something like um, chemical peels where essentially the same thing. You're chemically removing layers of the outer skin so that the fresh new layers that come in are more resistant to, to the wrinkles and have just less coloration and just look like fresher skin. I really care what I put in my body. I want consistent results. I want something that keeps me, well, looking like me. Yeah, neuromodulators such as Xeomin are uh, toxins. So they're produced by a anaerobic bacterium called Clostridium botulinum. So there's actually a bacteria uh, in this world that produces a toxin that's extremely toxic. It's basically produced in a way for these neuromodulators that allow us to take small minute doses and use them on the face to try to improve the status of our wrinkles. Kind of an odd concept, but that's what we do. Also, I want to mention here that neuromodulators are not just for cosmetic purposes. It's not just to look better. It's also sometimes for functional reasons. So for example, if someone has very bad migraines and a lot of that can stem from tension in different muscles around the head, so neuromodulator into some of those muscles can actually help with people's headaches and migraines. Me, because there's no one way to define beauty. With a smart toxin like Xeomin, so they're calling it a smart toxin. Not really sure what makes it smart and what makes another toxin dumb. Unclear. It's on my terms. Aesthetics and the beauty industry has been booming for a long time. And um, I guess it's reached the point where people feel like it's an empowerment type of um, perspective to undergo some of these procedures. And I have to say, I commend Joe for going through this type of treatment and for talking about his experience. I'm sure he got paid by ZMN to do this, but still, it's nice to see some celebrities actually talking about some of the things they have, they've had done and some of the work that uh, they may maybe want to do. Botulinum toxin A is an FDA-approved treatment used to temporarily improve the look of moderate to severe frown lines between the eyebrows. Effects of ZMN may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious... See, they're saying that the improvement and the FDA approval I'm pretty sure it's just for the glabellar area. So keep in mind that many times medications are used off-label, meaning they're not FDA approved for a specific procedure or for a specific injection point, but they're still being used by um, the provider, usually a physician or a mid-level provider who works under a physician, because they're still overall quite safe. It's pretty clear to me that uh, Joe has had injections of the Xeomin into his forehead. However, the FDA approval is only for between the eyebrows, which is the glabellar area. So he did have some off-label injections prior to the shoot as far as I can tell. Symptoms. Alert your doctor is difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness can be signs of life-threatening. So now they go into all of these different risks. Alert your doctor, if there's difficulty speaking, swallowing. So if a high enough dose is injected, there could be some systemic absorption. And because this is such a potent toxin, you could theoretically get some of these different symptoms that they're describing. Usually that's Totally not the case, but they need to, of course, mention it. An area where you can get potential changes in your speech and in the way that you swallow is if the neuromodular is placed into the neck. So some people get this stuff placed into these um, bands that can form over time to soften the neck and to soften the bands, which is the bands are coming from the platysma muscle. But as you do that, if the injections are placed too deep or if they're placed at a high enough dose, then you can potentially get changes in speech and swallowing. That's the more common way to do it, as opposed to just injecting too much locally up here and getting some kind of systemic absorption. One other complication that you may see online, people like posting this specific complication, is upper eyelid droop. And this comes from the spread of the neuromodulator. When it's injected into the glabella or the crow's feet area, it could migrate to the levator muscle, specifically the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. As it does that, it could lead to the upper lid drooping. Conditions. Side effects may include allergic reactions, headache, injection site pain, eyelid drooping, and swelling. Tell your doctor about your medical history, muscle, and nerve. See, they said eyelid drooping. Nerve conditions and all medicines, especially. See, they're saying here in their 
small font here. Tell your doctor if you have ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis or Lambert-Eaton syndrome. So all these different types of neurological conditions that would not be best to combine with these neuromodulators. Every muscle and nerve conditions in all medicines, especially botulinum toxins, muscle relaxants, and blood thinners, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. Doses of Xeomin are not the same as other botulinum toxins. So they're saying that if you're on a blood thinner, you should tell your doctor. And the reason is because anytime you put a needle into the face, you're potentially going to risk hitting a blood vessel and then you can bleed more. And if you bleed more, you'll usually bruise more. So if someone's on a blood thinner, that's not the best for doing these injections. It's not impossible to do, but it's definitely something that needs to be taken into account prior to starting these injections. So they're saying doses of Xeomin are not the same as other botulinum toxins. So yes, that is generally true. But keep in mind that when you're talking about the comparison of Xeomin to Botox, in general, they're very similar. The dosing is pretty much the same. Xeomin does not need to be refrigerated, um, as opposed to Botox and Dysport that do need to be refrigerated. They all come from Clostridium botulinum bacteria, and they all involve the type A type of toxin when you talk about all three different neuromodulators. The differences then between Botox and Xeomin compared to Dysport is that Dysport does have different dosing, and that requires some getting used to from the provider side. This port is also known to diffuse a little bit more as far as its impact on an area compared to Xeomin and Botox that are a little bit more pinpoint with how they target specific muscles. I should also mention here that Daxi is a new type of neuromodulator that is supposed to be active for about six to eight months. The other three are active for about three months. After that point, the effect of it wears off. So you start to lose that paralysis and you start to see the lines come back. Now this new medication that I believe will be soon FDA approved, Daxi, can last for much longer. Now, is that a good thing? Well, it depends. What if the injection wasn't done that well? Or what, what if you're not happy with it? What if you feel that, like for Joe, for example, what if his right side of his forehead was over injected. You're sort of stuck that way for a long time, at least half a year. So the advantage is that you don't have to go as often to get the procedure done. The disadvantage is that if you're not happy, like let's say you did get the eyelid droop, well, there you have it for six to eight months, you're just gonna pretty much stay that way. Of course, there are other things that can be done. Like I mentioned, there's special drops and other stuff, but in general, you will have some impact of that injection for a long time. And one question I often get is, is neurotoxin preventative in some fashion? And some people say no, some people say yes. My opinion is that in a way it is preventative because if you have really strong etched in lines, whether they're the horizontal lines of the forehead or the vertical lines of the glabella, it becomes much more difficult to treat compared to having just some fine lines that are more or less dynamic in nature, meaning they haven't completely etched in yet, and then you start the neuromodulator, you can often keep them from getting etched in. In that sense, the neuromodulator can be preventative, probably one of the only preventative things, in my opinion, that exist in, in aesthetics. Most other things just treat like the symptom or the um, ultimate effect of something as opposed to being more preventative. I talk a lot on this channel about celebrities and the different work that they may have had done. Sometimes they actually tell us here, such as Joe, but even then we're trying to figure out like which areas may have been injected, right? So make sure to check out our celebrity series when it comes to different types of plastic surgery interventions.